Good Friday afternoon to you, 4 o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Thanks for joining us. Hope your weekend is off to a great start. Uh, a good night for the Browns out at uh, in Las Vegas at the NFL Honors Award Banquet yesterday. They win all four of the awards they were up for. Flacco, Comeback Player of the Year. Miles Garrett, Defensive Player of the Year. Kevin Stefanski, Coach of the Year. Jim Schwartz as the Assistant Coach of the Year. Uh, let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Everybody excited about this? Hi, this is Rico. I want to talk about the Browns basically sweeping the NFL award honors. I'm so happy for Miles Garrett. He finally won his coveted Defensive Player of the Year award. Jim Schwartz winning the Associate Coach of the Year is incredible. Definitely deserving of that award. And Coach Stefanski, this is a second Coach of the Year award in four seasons. I mean, that's an elite company already. And all the injuries that we had, he had some stiff competition, but he deserved that award as well. The one that troubles me the most is the Joe Flacco winning Comeback Player of the Year. Like, fine, we'll, we'll take all the awards we could get. But I bet you every single one of those coaches slash players will trade in that award for the ultimate award, which is the Lombardi Trophy. Just wanted to say that. Go Browns. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Let's welcome in G. Bush, 92.3 The Fan, the ultimate Cleveland sports show. Um, G. Bush, here's something important to note. Voted on by the Associated Press writers, not one of the people voting was from Cleveland. So it, it's as unbiased <laughs> as you get. And we got that, that, that is a, it, you know, in the, you know, as my grandma would say, uh, and she, she loved frequenting the bingo holes. That is a good bingo after you read it off. Like, uh, so, yeah, man, it, you know, for once, you know, I'm happy for, for the Browns. I'm happy for uh, the organization because, look, you know, there's a lot of times the Browns don't, they, they're not mentioned very often. When I was growing up, you know, you very rarely saw the Browns on TV, Monday Night Football. You very rarely, you know, saw our players in the Pro Bowl. You didn't really get any, any of that notoriety uh, that a lot of the teams like the Cowboys and the 49ers and, of course, the Steelers got. So now, you know, for, for the fans, I think it's a good feel-good story. Um, and when you look, through, look at it, you look at a guy like Miles Garrett, I, I think that this, this will bring him some peace. I think uh, there's for a lot of years where Miles Garrett really, you know, looked at that, at that award as a way to validate you, him as a great defensive player. And I think a lot of people um, need that stamp of approval, especially in a game like defense, right? You know, you, know, you don't, you've, defensive players aren't, uh, eligible, most likely, to win an MVP. They have the defensive player of the year, defensive rookie player of the year. So for him, for defensive guys, this is like the MVP of what they do. So, Miles, I think he'll he'll look at this and he'll be able to come back. And I think he'll start to transition his focus. I think he'll he'll start to think about now the ultimate goal. Not, not, not that he didn't before, but now – the thing that is really going to try to complete um, the team is, is winning that Lombardi Trophy, as the caller said. Uh, Joe Flacco winning the comeback player of the year. I think that's a really good for him. And, and, you know, I had an opportunity to interview Joe Flacco, and I asked him point blank. I said, hey, Joe, do you feel like you're one of the best 32 in the universe and that you are a player that can, can start in this league? And he said, of course I do. And so I think this validates him and puts him back on the track where – potentially he can get another job where he could be looked at as a starter, whether it's a bridge starter uh, of a team that gets a younger quarterback. And, and I think he did a lot for our city. He did a lot for the Cleveland Browns. And it's Kevin Stefanski. Let's talk about, um, you know, let's be clear. Uh, you know, two, two uh, head coaches of the year, and he did it uh, under two tremendous, uh, tremendous, you know, stints of adversity. One was during COVID. The other, you've got five quarterbacks, and I believe he's only one of 13 individuals ever to win two uh, head coaches of the year awards. So for me, uh, you know, it, it just it just shows that him in his hire of Schwartz and showing that Schwartz is now the top assistant. I think it has go got to go off to the coaching staff uh, for putting together that type of staff and having the year they did. They, they did. Yeah, without question. We'll get into Coach Stefanski and where that uh, – we got that list, and it's an impressive one. Uh, take a look at this, and, and there's some 
all of these awards were really close, and, and um, you know, you could have made a case for any. Here's the Defensive Player of the Year voting, and uh, Miles Garrett had the highest number of first place votes, second highest in the uh, in the second place votes. You know, 16 for Parsons was there, and, and he, you know, he had the second highest and third place votes. Miles Garrett deserved that, um, it, it, but you know. No matter who you chose, there was going to be somebody that said something. Take a look. This is uh, um, Micah Parsons responding um, to somebody that says, Miles, uh, uh, it was a rig job. You know, the, uh, an, another NFL rig job. Uh, imagine looking at this if the guy on the left won the award um, and he never won it. So, and credit to Micah Parsons. Miles was the better player, reality of the situation. Miles faced way more double teams and had an effect on quarterbacks. Please stop looking at stats and look at film. And that's Micah Parsons, who finished third in the voting. T.J. Watt was uh, on social media, you know, what do you expect? Please, nobody's been overlooked for that award more than Miles Garrett. And I, and I believe T.J. Watt has already won a, a defensive player yep. of the year award. You know, I can understand that you, you know, everybody, every player wants to go out and every player, player wants to, you know, win as many as they can, you know. Uh, but we all we all know how these things go. Like, we understand it. Like, you know, Kobe Bryant has one NBA, NBA MVP. Um, I think LeBron has four. LeBron could have been MVP ten times, right? Um, it's just it's just about, you know, who had the better year. And one of the things that we look at is the Browns were the b better defensive team than all those teams on the, li on the list. And sometimes, I, you know, you get annoyed a little bit because it's like, hey, when you talk about other people, we, we'll, they'll break it down and say he's the best defender on the best defense or he's the best quarterback when, or, or he's the best player on the best, better, best offensive team in the league. And that player usually gets the nod for MVP. I just think it's a little rivalry that goes into it. I think, um, you know, the Steelers obviously um, have a rivalry with the, with the Browns, and Miles Garrett isn't probably one of the guys that uh, they really like to talk about, and I see, I mean, that he has had a lot of uh, history with the Browns and, and versus Steelers going back to the to the helmet issue. But the thing I give Miles, I give uh, Michael Parsons credit for, and I think Michael Parsons is going to be a tremendous analyst when you know when his, when he hangs it up is that he keeps it real. Like, he does a lot in the media. <laughs> he has his own podcast and blog. Uh, I watch it regularly, and he brings up a good point, man. You know, sometimes as defensive ends, and I play defensive ends, not nearly at what these guys play, <laughs> but, you know, we, you're right. When you when you watch the film, it's evident. It's not just the sacks. It's not – it's 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 the attention. It's the double teams. It's the chips. It's the slide in that direction. It's the hurries, the pressures, the, the, the time they got to throw the ball, two point seconds – 1.5 seconds or something crazy. Those are the things that defensive coordinators talk about. And I think actually for once, I think they did get it right. Miles Garrett was deserving of it. Um, there are some times where he's going to have a year and he may not get it because of what somebody else did. But I think, um, you know, that's just the way the ball bounces sometimes. All right. So we mentioned Kevin Stefanski winning the second uh, coach of the year award in um, the last four years. There are only three coaches that have won the award more than twice. Don Shula has won it four times. Chuck Knox, Bill Belichick, three times. Kevin Stefanski is, uh, has won it now twice. There's some pretty good guys that have won it twice. Bill Parcells, George Hallis, Joe Gibbs, Mike Ditka, Dan Reeves, Bruce Arians, Ron Rivera, Ali Sherman, and George Allen, if you want to go back uh, several years. Andrew Berry talked uh, about Kevin Stefanski getting the Coach of the Year award. We are so lucky to have Kevin as our as a leader of our organization and what he's been able to navigate uh, throughout the first four years here has been nothing short of remarkable, um, you know, battling all the adversity uh, that we had this season and guiding us to, um, you know, another playoff appearance um, is, is, is just phenomenal. And we're so lucky to have Kevin um, as a steward of our program. Um, the last four years and, and really into the foreseeable future. So, so proud of, of our team and organization and just uh, hope, hope the Browns family can, can help uh, in terms of thanking uh, the four individuals that, that, that won awards this week. And G. Bush, when you look at it, I mean, that's a ridiculous list of head coaches that he is now in the company of. 
Yeah, you, you listen. You know, we may be all detractors so at some point. You can't like everything about somebody, but I mean, when you got George Hallis and Mike Dicker and Shula and and, and Belichick, look, listen, listen, that's hard. You you can't take nothing away from that. I just gotta, I gotta just be honest, man. I, I whether you like play calling or you don't, you, you know, you don't like the fact that he doesn't say much or give away much. The man has won two Coach of the Year awards in four years, bro. You can't take that away from nobody. And um, you know, I, you you can say that you don't like certain things, aspects about his game, but what's undeniable is, and hey, n- men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And he got something that a lot of people don't. I don't even think Mike Tomlin and Harbaugh got two nope. coach of the years like that, right? You saw you know the what list. I'm saying? So that's the entire you, you see list. The list. Yep. When somebody can hold the list up like this, this the paperwork. <laughs> when you when you hold that up, you can't say nothing. And so, and I think I think you're gonna really see something because to me, I truly believe that he is gonna give up the play calling, and I think that he's gonna thrive for it. Not sometimes. Sometimes you can let go of something, and you may think it's a demotion, but it could be a promotion too. It could be. It could turn out that, that that he turns it over, and he and he still you know wins at a rate where you're saying, hey, he doesn't necessarily have to be a guy that has his hand on everything, right, on a play calling specifically, because as a coach, I think one of his best characteristics is the fact that the players love him. They play hard for him. You see it. It's the proof is in the pudding. There's lots of games where, and it's a lot of lot of teams that that would have folded like a cheap uh, tent if they had the same adversity. Let's look at the Jets. Aaron Rodgers goes down. Season's over. Chuck, they just closed everything up, wrapped it up. The only thing that kept them together was was the threat or the hope that hey, he's going on Pat McAfee talking about he's going to be back next week. Everybody knew he wasn't coming back next week. You got to stop Aaron Rodgers. But they, we, they, we, we could have been just like that. We got the P.J. Walkers. I mean, you look at this. The San Francisco 49ers is in the doggone Super Bowl. And they came here and got beat by P.J. Walker. The Baltimore Ravens went to the AFC Championship game. And we went in there and won the game, right? So, I mean, it is what it is. He, you know, shout out to him. He's well-deserving of it. And, um, you know, that's going to, that's a, that's a big blow for the detractors. <laughs> two, two, two of them? Woo. Yep, that uh, that extension is coming in the very near future, and he probably added, uh, probably up the figure a little bit as well um, uh, that he will he put in his pocket. Up. He didn't even, think about this. He didn't even show up and get the award. He's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to work with I'm, I'm, I'm going over plays right now. <laughs> G. Bush and I are going to step aside, take a quick time out. We will continue talking the, about some of the awards uh, that the Browns won last night. Sports for CLA. Be right back. Stay with us. You might have expected all the games and all the excitement. And even though you couldn't see it right away, it's all right here. Five games in one. 22 million in prizes between 25 and 500 bucks and a shot at a million dollar grand prize. Golden Casino, a night's worth of excitement for just 10 bucks. We continue talking Browns with G. Bush from 92.3 The Fan as well as the ultimate uh, Cleveland sports show. Uh, last night, a big night for the Browns without question. We mentioned they sweep the awards. Uh, they won Defensive Player of the Year, Comeback Player of the Year, Assistant Coach of the Year, and uh, Kevin Stefanski won his second um, Head Coach of the Year award in four years. Kevin Stefanski talked about the award winners. Just want to take a moment to acknowledge our guys, Coach Schwartz, so well-deserved assistant of the year. What he was able to accomplish in year one with this defensive staff, with these players, uh, was truly historic. Uh, And I'm so proud of Coach. I'm so proud that I get to work with Coach every single day. Joe Flacco, from the couch into the starting lineup. Uh, I know it was fun for you guys to watch. It was fun for me to watch. I had a pretty good view of it all. Uh, What he was able to do on the field, off the field, uh, was really remarkable. And I'm proud of Joe. Miles Garrett, uh, I'm running out of superlatives, guys. You're going to have to help me here. Uh, that is, that's Defensive Player of the Year. That's what it looks like. 
the, the what we saw week in and week out from Miles, you guys should have seen him work at practice. You should have seen him around the building and what he provides to this team as a leader. So I'm so proud of Miles, and this honor is very, very well deserved. And then I'm honored, guys. Uh, as you know, I could not do this thing by myself. I get incredible support from everybody in this building, our coaches, our players, our staff. Uh, I am so lucky. I am so blessed. Uh, I could not do this thing by myself. And then outside this building, to our fans, the best fans in the National Football League, the best fans in the world, Browns backers around the world, uh, here in Northeast Ohio, uh, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of, of the support that you guys give this football team. G. Bush, when you look at this, um, they kind of have gone from, you know, struggling, you know, you know, three, four, five wins to a, a fairly – they're going to be in the mix for the playoffs. The next step is even harder. Now you want to go from in the mix to in the playoffs and challenging. It, it's tougher to go from, you know, that – seven, eight, nine win to consistently 10, 11, 12 wins. And that's where they're at as a franchise. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a very good point. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's a, it's a bittersweet thing because you, you, you had a year like they did. Uh, you take a look at all the awards they swept, but then you look at just how difficult it is to win in the playoffs. You had all of that success. You had Flacco and you had these guys. Flacco and, 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 and Schwartz and Stefanski and, and, and Miles Garrett, all of them, they had an opportunity to, to do something on the field and they didn't. And they had an opportunity and it's not that they didn't try. It's the fact that it's so hard, so doggone hard to win in the NFL and you take a look at, you know, the, the, the difficulties it is. You got C.J. Stroud at home and, and and, and a great defense and D'Amico Ryans and and you lose that game and you lose it in a way where you kind of scratch your head like what happened. Then you go into the offseason and instead of having this celebration, you got a new offensive coordinator, you got a new running backs coach, new old line coach, uh, Bill Callahan, which was a staple of what you're do, do, doing the pillar on the offensive side of the football. And now you have to come up on the fly and create an offense that that gets Deshaun Watson um, to get to him and him to play to the best of his ability. So you see it. Yeah, you, you've done a lot of things, but that's why the NFL is so difficult. They, tell, they say it's not for long. You know, you take a while to look at who's in the, in the Super Bowl right now. It's one Patrick Mahomes. He wins, and to me, he's the Michael Jordan of, uh, of football right now. I mean, the guy can, you know, he, he's been in the AFC Championship games, the Super Bowls, and you're going to have to do something extraordinary with your roster and that quarterback and all, and everybody's going to have to do something if you want to take and get rid of and, 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 and surpass a guy like Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. So you look at it, and, and the changes on the offensive staff are pretty significant. You know, you, you've got – Ken Dorsey, now you got Dickerson, you bring in Rees, um, you bring in Deuce Staley. Mm. Do you expect the, the offense to look um, different? Will it look different enough? Will they, will they be able to change it enough to showcase Deshaun Watson? Or to it, not even showcase, to let him be as good as he can potentially be? I think with the addition, um, you know, like it, the season runs in, you know, like when I was in college, um, the season broke up into two part, parts, right? When the season was there, you were uh, underneath your position coach and you were so, uh, you know, in, in tune with what you were doing, specifically game in and game out. When the season was over, uh, you got, you broke away a little bit at, at a time and then they transitioned you to, uh, the strength and conditioning coordinator uh, and, and the academics uh, people, right? Now you're doing your study tables, you're lifting weights, you're trying to get it better, you go to spring ball. Now you're in, in spring ball, you're back into the mix with some of your coaching staff, and then in the summer, it was your team captains and it was the veterans that would lead this stuff up and doing your extra runs. I think the same thing is going to have to be for this, this team with the Cleveland Browns. They did a good job, the coaching, everything they needed to do in the season, they won the awards, now we talk about this. It's, it's up to your rehab. How does Chubb come back? How does Deshaun Watson come back? Is Jack Conklin going to be ready? What about Dewan Jones, Jed Will, some of those big names? Are they going to have their legs underneath them? Then you take a look at it, Andrew Barry. We got the draft and we got free agency. If you can get me a couple of pieces, you need a receiver, 
You might need to look at running back. You may need to look at linebacker. Uh, they need to get better at some places, especially receiver. Now it's time for Andrew Barry to take over. If they can get Deshaun Watson some of the pieces and parts that he needs, and they do have a new fresh take on offense, doesn't have to necessarily be drastically different, but a fresh take on it. Some of the stuff that the Rams can do where you can scheme guys open with motion. Some of the stuff that uh, that, that what the Shanahan can do with getting receivers open and, and running the ball at the same time. If you could do that, I think this offense could look a little bit different. And I think they could be a team that throws the ball 65% of the time uh, versus running it, you know, 60% and running play action. All right. So um, you, you and I have agreed wide receiver is a need. Take a look at this note and you'll see. Why is wide receiver such a huge need for the Browns uh, in this upcoming season? Uh, passing game was a one-man show for the Browns um, in 2023. Of the 27 catches that were 20 yards downfield or more, Amari Cooper had 13 of them. That's 48%. Passing game was 28th in yards gained per attempt, 6.4. And again, that, that was with Joe Flacco. When Joe Flacco looked like it was kind of up, you know, a, a, there was a huge uptick when, when Joe Flacco took over. Um, I, they need, I, I think you need a backup plan at running back as well. You hope Nick Chubb comes back, but I don't know that you can count on that. Yeah, and I'll start there first. What you said with the running back. Listen, as this season goes on, you know I I, I like Jerome Ford, um, but I, I need the I need the Browns to have somebody in the pocket where. I know what they can do. I think Jerome Ford left a lot of food on his plate. There was a lot of times where, you know, the vision, um, sometimes, you know, hitting the hole quick enough, um, the tough runs in between the tackles le left a lot to be desired. And on the goal line, you got to look at it. Your goal line and short yardage back was uh, Kareem Hunt this year, almost to nine touchdowns. And when the, when it got tough, got going and, and you needed one of those yards, the, the guy that was in the game was Kareem Hunt. I think you might need to go out and find you another running back to challenge uh, Jerome Ford. I think you need a guy that could be a little tougher and see and let him fight it out and figure out how it's going to run. Because I don't think you can you can you know depend on Nick Chubb. I mean, this is a second major injury going back to Georgia. We hope that he comes back the same back, but you can't count on that. And then the receiving core, you gotta get you gotta get chunk yards. And I understand what some would say. Hey, you got David and Joku. That's fine, but but. Just take an inventory of who's in the Super Bowl, right? The, the, the 49ers got Christian McCaffrey. They got Ayuk. They got Debo Samuel. They got that. They got Hughes check. They got, uh, they, they got uh, George Kittle. They got five or six guys that can threaten you. They even got Jennings on each level, right? So if you want to look at the other teams and how they're doing and how they get, to get there, not to mention the guys that are in your division, uh, you got a guy in the division, Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow coming back next year. Lamar M. Jackson won an MVP. And, oh, by the way, the Steelers, all they did is go to the playoffs with the quarterback, with no quarterback again. So it, you can't rest on your laurels. I cannot stress this enough. You, if you want Deshaun Watson to do what you think Deshaun Watson is going to do, if you buy a house in this world, the first thing they tell you when you buy that house is, hey, uh, where's your insurance? That got to go in escrow. You can't buy no $500,000 million house and ain't got no homeowner's insurance. Crazy. If you got Deshaun Watson and he need $230 million, you got to have multiple pieces and parts if you want to see it. I'm with you. You mentioned the Super Bowl coming up uh, this weekend. Some native Clevelanders will be involved. Travis Kelsey um, has become one of the best tight ends in NFL history, and he's never forgotten where he came from. Travis Kelsey played basketball and football for the Cleveland Heights High School Tigers, continues to be connective and supportive of Cleveland Heights High School, both programs, football and the basketball program. Uh, for Cleveland Heights High School, he was an option quarterback. A pretty good one at that as well. Um, on the basketball field, he was... Uh, power forward type but again you see Kelsey throwing the football during Super Bowl week Kelsey talked about how important his hometown of Cleveland Heights is to him I'd love to show coming from Cleveland Heights 
Um, it's a beautiful city. It's a melting pot of all different ethnicities and social classes. And um, it's really shaped my understanding of accepting people and, uh, and, and really, you know, not only that, but enjoying everyone else's uh, cultures growing up. Um, I have so many friends of different races and, and, and just, uh, like I said, their, their family is different social classes and stuff. And uh, it's just given me a, a good understanding of, you know, who I am and how to accept everybody for who they are. And uh, I can't thank Cleveland Heights enough for that. You know, outside of that, giving me the desire and the love for life because of how happy I was as a kid. Um, it's just uh, that school system and the, the community, the families in that community uh, that mean everything to me. And G. Bush, he has stayed connected. You always see him um, tweeting out about Cleveland Heights, and, and you see the program kind of reciprocating that as well. Man, you know, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a big one, and it's I, I like that story so much because I'm I'm a um, you know I'm a I'm a product of, of public schools, right? You know, nowadays, you know, you know, there's a th thought process that if you if you're the best and you're the brightest. You're going to no no knock against the Ignatiuses and the Eds of the world. They got a tremendous program over there. Um, you know they got a great infrastructure. But you know I, I show I try to show love for those uh, people as Travis does um, for for the city schools, for the schools that are, are your local schools that you go to, that you're in, indoctrinated into. And, and and I love the fact that you you're all right. You you are forced to be tolerant to other people's cultures. You are introduced to so many things outside your comfort level. And I think it makes, you know, when you go to city schools, it makes you a more well-rounded uh, individual, a more productive member of society because you learn that you gotta, you gotta be able to work with and deal with a lot of people. So I'm just happy that him being one of the, the most famous people in the world right now, uh, notwithstanding who he, who he dates, and he has 97 commercials out. He's the pitch guy, the new pitch guy. Uh, multiple times Super Bowl, well, you know, Patrick Mahomes, but for him to still shout out uh, Cleveland Heights and, and shout out that community shows that, um, you know, he, he ain't never forgot where he came from. And that's one thing that everybody likes to, to be said. If, if you want your deathbed, even if you become the most successful person in the world, everybody want, want the pastor to say he never forgot where he came from. G. Bush, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time Thank and the so insight. Much. Thanks very much, G. Bush. Appreciate you. All right, G. Bush, make sure you check him out. 92.3 The Fans, The Barber Shop, Saturday mornings, 8 till noon. You can also catch him Monday through Friday on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, 11 until 1 o'clock. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, Lance Risland joins us. Film breakdown, video analysis of how the Browns might use some motion in the offense next year. Sports with CLA, be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. continue talking Browns on Sports 4 CLE. If you pay attention to the show, you've heard us talk about motion in the Browns and how they were one of the uh, offenses that used it the least and the guys that use it the most seem to be the most successful. Time to take a video analysis film breakdown of Kevin Stefanski and how the Browns use motion. Whenever we do that, we welcome in Lance Risland from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, Lance, the, the trend in the NFL is to use more motion. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the exact same kind of motion is, is one of the things you've been telling me. Yeah, you know, I've, there's two different philosophies, and, and there's, a, there's different ways to look at it. But what Stefanski does is they do a lot of shifts, and they do a lot of uh, pre-snap stuff, and they do a lot of um, per, uh, personnel groups, and there's different ways to look at it. But the new motion, the McVeighs, the McDaniels, uh, the Shanahan's, they use a lot of this fast motion. You heard the cheetah motion with uh, McDaniel, with Tyreek Hill. And there's just a lot of different ways to do things. Um, you know, the bottom line with the motion is you're trying to declare coverage. You're trying to create a numbers advantage. You're trying to create leverage. Uh, so regardless of what the motion is, um, you know, they all have basically the same 
uh, responsibility or the same, you know, goal in mind, and that's to create those things for an offense. So it, it, Stefanski, I think, has always been a guy who likes to learn and, and will try new things, and I think Dickerson – uh, being added to the staff will do that because of his time with McVay out in L.A. Uh, but Stefanski does a really good job. It's subtle motion, but there's a purpose to it uh, on down a distance, and, and I really like what he does. All right, let's take a look at the first clip, and, and um, you're telling us this is uh, something to pay attention to here. So you're going to see motion here. So third down, he does a really good job. His third down stuff and his red zone stuff are some of my favorite. Uh, not because he's a Browns guy, because I watch a lot of film and I really like it. So you're going to see Cooper go in motion. What the Bears are going to do is the Bears are going to show a cover two free snap. And Flacco uh, is a veteran guy. He understands that. So what the motion does, it makes them declare. So you're going to see that by the 40-yard line, you're going to see Tyreek Stevens in the corner. He's going to bump out. He's the guy who makes the tackle. And Brisker is going to move up and take Njoku. Now Flacco knows it's cover one because the other, uh, other safety, Jackson, is going to move up. Now what this does with motion is that because Stevenson has to bump out and take Cooper, Right, he's already too deep. The Joku will take away the under underneath coverage, and Cooper's wide open. So by motioning, it told Flacco it was man coverage. Very simple, subtle motion, but it told him it was man coverage. They run a stack, so it would be hard to press, and Cooper gets an easy uh, easy completion for a first down. So it doesn't look like much, but it shows Flacco what the coverage is, and that's kind of the first thing in motion when you talk about what quarterbacks want is tell me what the coverage is, and, and this is what this uh, motion does here on this easy third down pickup. And, you know, if you take it a step further, a lot of times, Lance, um, the Browns or any game plan will say, if we have this guy in man-to-man -man coverage, we like that matchup. And, and so, again, that's, it goes to, to getting the ball to guys that can do things um, where you want them as well. Um, take us through this next clip, another, another motion in what you see here. Well, so, obviously, Njoku had a big game uh, against the Jets. He started playing well. This is kind of when he got really hot. So the Jets put Sauce Gardner on him. And you're going to see him go in motion. He's going to stack. And what that does, it, with the motion, because Flacco, again, knows it's man coverage, they run a, like an a, a out route or a blaze out route with more up top. And what that does, what the motion did on this, again, not the tricky kind of the motion everybody likes nowadays. It just tells the quarterback what coverage it is. Because Sauce Gardner's not running with, the joke move less it's man coverage. Now, what Flacco understands, even though Reed's a good cover guy, is that Moore's a very good route runner, especially in the red zone. And it's very hard for a corner with this reduced split to cover all that sideline. So Moore does a great job of running routes. And this is just about impossible for even a good corner to cover because there's so much space. But again, Flacco knew he had the space because of the motion from the Joku, which gave the Browns man coverage and it resulted in an easy touchdown. So once again, a little smash combination High, low, easy read, easy throw for Flacco. So, again, that um, kind of declares coverage. It, it tells the quarterback where he wants to go with the ball. All right, this, um, the next couple of clips, um, take us through what these are telling some different things that motion can do. So this play's got a lot to it, a lot, a lot of fun here, a lot of, uh, a lot of guys doing the right thing. So David Bell's going to come in motion. As David Bell comes in motion, it kind of it takes him from one strong to now three strong inside. Now, what the Jaguars are going to do when it goes back is the Jaguars are going to cover, they're going to cover Najoku on the quick out man coverage. Now, what teams like to do is they like to run a bracket coverage, and the Browns end up in a bunch. And when you end up in a bunch, the corner, Williams, he's supposed to take the first guy outside. And then inside, the first guy who releases inside, Jenkins, is supposed to cover. It's called a like bracket coverage or banjo coverage. Everybody runs it from high school to pro. But what happens with the motion, even though it's not a lot, it tricks, it fools those guys, it confuses those guys, and both Williams and Jenkins jump uh, Elijah Moore, who's going to be the guy who comes across first. Uh, David Bell sees that. He's going to trail, and you're going to see both guys jump Elijah Moore, and Bell just sits right there. And with, with the motion, the reason that happened is because the motion, the motion knew. Now, another thing that's really cool about this play is that the Jaguars bring seven. And by bringing seven... Flacco knows the middle guy is going to be blocked and he has to retreat to his right so he can beat Wingard before he gets there. Because they can't block seven, they can only block six. So just a really cool play, a well-coached play. Um, the, the subtle motion bringing him from outside to inside confused who had who with Williams and Jenkins. And that's all you need in the NFL is just one mistake 
and it ends up in an easy touchdown for Bell. Yeah, again, you, you mentioned all the guys that did their job there, and, and motion creates um, the, the mismatch there. Um, uh, can do it in the run game, too. Take us through this next clip, what you see here. So again, Browns are going to motion to a bunch here now. One of their classic plays, they do it a bunch of different ways from the gun and one under. It's just a pin and pull play. So they're going to block down with the outside guy. A lot of times it's Najoku. Uh, it's been a receiver before. It's been, you know, peop, uh, DPJ when he was here. It's been all the tight ends. Bryant's kind of their move guy. And, and what it does is that they're going from a two-by-two two formation, motioning to a bunch formation, which gives them an extra hat over there. So simply, you're going to see the point guy block down a defensive end and then they get two blockers out in front. Browns do a really good job. Uh, Bryant does this a lot, the receivers do it a lot. This is also the thing you can see now um, with the new Dick, with the new uh, O-line coach Dickerson. Because one of, not only is motion one of the big things that McVay and all these guys use, but they use receivers uh, almost as linemen and tight ends in their blocking schemes. And this is something you can see from the Browns moving forward too. This condensed formation, get to the edge, uh, get extra hats, but again, very subtle motion, just across the formation that gives you an extra hat. Now you're in a three by one. So again, simple, Stavansky does a great job with this and their run game is always really, really good. Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, when you mentioned wide receivers blocking in the run game, Cedric Tillman pops out because uh, we saw him um, even as a rookie in that scheme with some, some really nice job blocking. All right, uh, take us through this last clip, of what you see here. All right, it's one of my favorites here. So this is a this is a cover two look from the uh, Texans. This is the opening play of the game. What I like about this is the motion means absolutely nothing if you if you don't like football. So David Bell is going to go from the outside and he's going to motion down in. Now as he motions down in, he was originally covered by Nelson. Nelson with the motion will now move down and he's got Cooper. But when he moves down onto Cooper, he's still outside. So the motion created leverage for Cooper. Now. The safety, the safety um, uh, ward, ward gets caught because of Bell's motion to think that it's a run game because it's first down. So not only does Bell coming down inside, but the Browns also pull Wyatt Teller from the right side. So you're going to see Wyatt Teller pull, bring him down, and it looks like a run play. Now Jimmy Ward, that safety, he gets his caught, he gets his feet caught in mud, we call it. And basically what that means is he does not backpedal. So Nelson, who has been leveraged by motion, and Ward, who bites on the run fake. Nelson doesn't have help and he gets beat over the top. So that subtle motion to make it look like a run play added with Teller pulling created this play on the opening play. And this is this is really good stuff, really subtle. Um, but this is all set up by that motion inside. Created everything simply by moving Bell outside to inside and adding an extra blocker. All right, so that's kind of what we see from the Browns. They overhauled the, the coaching staff on the offensive side of the ball. Um, which that's not uncommon. Do you expect to see more motion, more of the eye candy stuff that's kind of become um, the latest and greatest in the NFL, or, or do you think it stays pretty much similar? Uh, you know, I, well, obviously, I think as a coach, everybody sticks with what they're good at. Everybody sticks to what you know. The reason Kevin Stefanski got there is what he did in Minnesota, and I don't think you should ever, as a coach, I don't think you should do two things. One is I don't think you should ever go away from what your bread and butter is. Two is I don't think you should ever stop learning. And and I think Stefanski's done a great job of adjusting to what he has, trying to make it work with Deshaun Watson. And and I think the overhaul, now you bring in Dickerson. When, what bringing in Dickerson me, means to me is that the Browns are going to take a look at that because Dickerson was with McVay for eight years out in L.A. So not only do they use motion, but McVay is really good in Shanahan and uh, McDaniel. They also use these condensed formations with the motion. And I think that's something you're going to see because of the Browns with Watson. It helps in... Um, you can get more receivers on the field because now you're going to ask those receivers to not only catch but block. So I do see the Browns. I don't see them going to, you know, a total San Francisco style, uh, but I do think he will implement it. Uh, it's a copycat league, and, and you're going to copy. We all do. We all steal stuff from guys who do it the best. And if, it, if you're doing it as a coach and it's going well and another coach doesn't take it, shame on them. And that's what I always did if a coach. There's lots of guys who are really smart, and, and, and Stefanski's one of them, and Shanahan, all these guys. So anything anything that has success, coaches will steal it. And uh, I'm no different, and neither is any other coach who uh, tries, to, tries to do the best he can. As always, great stuff, Lance Reisland. Uh, appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Lance. 
As always, thanks for having me. Lance Roslin, a really good, insightful breakdown of how Kevin Stefanski uses motion and what the new coaches um, on the staff may do with motion coming up next season. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as Academic All-Stars and Teachers of the Month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Well, it's wonderful to see that uh, Miles Garrett became a Defensive Player of the Year. Well-deserved. He should have been that for many years. He definitely is the best defensive player in the uh, league. And Hall of Famer Lynn Ford is looking down at him and smiling all the way. This guy, Garrett, is something special. Have a good day, sir. As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Of course, uh, Miles Garrett, one of four Browns who uh, won awards yesterday. After winning that Defensive Player of the Year award, um, Miles Garrett, look into the future with the Browns. I want to thank my, my lovely parents who are in attendance today. I mean, without y'all love and, and support and y'all y'all being perfect examples for me, now this wouldn't be possible. Uh, I want to thank my, my brother and my sister who have also been great examples for me. I want to thank the, the Browns organization for y'all believing in me. Jimmy, D. Haslam, um, Andrew Berry, uh, Kevin Stefanski, Schwartz, and uh, man, we had a, a hell of a brotherhood that helped support me and get me here as well. And I have a, a, a great uh, team that has been around me for the last two years, helped support me with my, my, uh, my wellness, you know, getting together. Shay, Coral, Nicole, uh, my, my high school coach, who I was able to bring here and, and bring into uh, attendance, Coach Gonzo. Thank you. It's been a blessing. And to the city of Cleveland, this one's for you. We're going to bring, bring home something bigger next time. Let's go. And with that, let's welcome in Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Fred, um, yeah, Browns sweep all four awards they were up for. Schwartz, defensive assistant. Kevin Spansky, head coach of the year. Flacco, comeback player of the year. Uh, Garrett, defensive player of the year. When you look at Garrett in, in particular, it's probably a little bit overdue. Um, do you think he's on a Hall of Fame trajectory just the way he is uh, performed? Yeah, I think there's no question. Um, you look at the guys that have, you know, Dwight Freeney, I think, is this year's um, a nominee. But you think of edge rushers. I mean, Garrett isn't like he just did this once. I mean, if you look statistically, this might have been one of his lower statistics in recent years. A lot of people just look at the sacks and things like that. I know Kevin Stefanski, Jim Schwartz emphasized a lot what he makes a difference, you know, in other teams game planning and taking him out, you know, and they even his, his win rate, even despite getting double and triple teamed was right up there at the top. Um, I just think that he's definitely on a Hall of Fame career. The biggest thing would be now you're going into like seventh, eighth year. If you had an injury, heaven forbid, cut you short. But I think two, three more years, I mean, you can't you can't argue with what he's done. You know, Joe Thomas did it for 10 years. And most guys with that pedigree do so. And I think one of the things that stood out to me, is Miles was really championing that cause earlier in his career. He talked about being defensive player of the year, and that's really drove him and so forth. I don't know if he matured or he just realized, you know, I got to quit campaigning for it. 
this year he talked all about the team and the support and the system and winning games and said all the right things. And this year it happened for him. Um, I know TJ Watt was upset. He had maybe better statistics, but I think some of the things that Schwartz and Stefanski pointed out were important. And those that voted, you know, he, you know, he won his first. And, and I think that there's no reason he couldn't, you know, have, have multiple. I mean, I, I think anybody that watches thinks he could have, you know, had much bigger numbers. I mean, he didn't have any sacks really in the last five, six games. He might have had one, but he had a big sack on a two point conversion that was big in a win that didn't count as a stat. And so I think, I think the support system and buying into that has really helped him and that team approach you know, has in, in the Browns success. I mean, if they were three and 14, I don't think he wins this, but you're the number one player on the number one defense. So how do you, how do you not give it to the top guy on that defense? So uh, let me ask you this. Do you think Zadarius Smith is the best um, edge rusher that Miles Garrett has been paired with in his career here? I think so. And I think that, I think, maybe the pairing of Zadarius Smith and Obo Okoronkwo because they would rotate and you didn't have that big a drop off. I mean, Jadavian Clowney was pretty good, but he would go out, you know, more often and they didn't really have the depth there. So I think, I think Zadarius Smith, I was a big proponent of that trade last year. He didn't have the numbers that I was expecting, but According to Jim Schwartz, he felt like he was right there with Miles in his importance, and I would think he'd be a priority to try to re-sign. Um, I know they got Okoronkwo as a free agent last year to a multi-year deal, and Alex Wright came on, so I just don't know if they'll feel they have pressing needs somewhere else. I think ultimately it'll come down to Jim Schwartz and how much he pushes for him and how much Smith is demand on the open market. Yeah, and I'm with you. I think that unit, the defensive line, created some chaos. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Take a look at these numbers. This is from Next Gen, Next Gen Stats. Fewest yards per attempt allowed in zone coverage. Um, and the Browns are tied with the Kansas City Chiefs for the fewest yards at uh, six. Uh, you see the Ravens, 6-1. 49ers 6.2 so <laughs> they're in the neighborhood with the team that had the best record in the regular season the Ravens and the two teams that are playing in the Super Bowl um, but the fact that they allowed so few yards in zone coverage is surprising because they played a lot of man coverage yeah they did and I think in the past there was some you know under Joe Woods statistics came out similar saying that they were so good against in man-to-man -man coverage but they weren't in man-to-man -man that often under Joe Woods. They were mostly in zone. So, yeah, you would have thought as much as they played man-to-man -man and they still were ranked at the top, I think it, it bodes well. And I do think that the defense, despite that playoff game where they really were lit up, you know, really played the whole year good enough, you know, to win games. It was the offense that let them down early in the season say what you will about quarterbacks, number of them and injuries and so forth. But the offense really, you know, you know, let them down. I think the defense averaged around 21 a game. Any, any top 10, top 15 offense is going to score more than that per game. And, and that should have been enough. And I think the giveaways, the offense just couldn't overcome to score enough points, didn't have enough possession. So to your point, I think they should do everything they can to keep this defense as intact as they can. Yeah, the other thing is, is um, you know, we Andrew Barry's free agency and, and additions have made sense the last several years. So last year, spent big on the defense, specifically that line and, and then the safety position. Do you expect them to address the needs on offense in free agency this year? I, you, you, they need some playmakers to, to help the offense out a little bit. I think so. I think that they realize, you know, despite all the quarterback play, 
that the big move last year was trading your second round pick for Elijah Moore. And I thought it was a good move from everything I had heard and what I saw in training camp. I didn't really see him be the <clears throat> difference maker that I was expecting in the offense. Um, he, they tried to use him a lot in, in gadget plays and rushing jet sweeps, but he couldn't turn the corner. I mean, I think they finally scrapped that. He only had 11 yards of rushing, but he did have 59 catches. And I think he could really be, you know, he could take another leap next year, but I would really like another wide receiver, you know, between Amari Cooper and more, or even one at the top of the, of the depth chart. I don't know if you can do that. And if Cooper was in a number two role, but definitely a top three wide receiver. I don't think you can count on Cedric Tillman or David Bell. Those are the, the biggest names returning to be that guy. And so I, I think, in my opinion, you want to get as many weapons around Deshaun Watson as you can. Last year, they added Marquise Goodwin as the speed guy in free agency. They made the trade for Elijah Moore, and they drafted Cedric Tillman with their highest draft pick. So I just think that they look at that and say, okay, we helped, but we still didn't get totally what we won. I don't think you you have enough, in other words, to go into this season. Relying on Cooper and David Njoko is your top two threats in receiving. I think they're good, obviously. But if Cooper's down at all, you're toast. And the same thing with Njoku. I think when they traded Donovan Peoples-Jones, who was their number two receiver, that told you they were moving on from him. So they need to really, I think, address that area again, um, probably in a trade is what I would think. I don't know if they go into free agency and and get into a bidding war for somebody they want, but their top two receivers now in the team were both acquired in trades. Fred Greetham, senior analyst from the Orange and Brown Report. Now I can step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we'll continue to talk some offense. Uh, we'll start with the offensive changes to the coaching staff. Sports for Seattle, you're right back. Stay with us. You might have expected all the games and all the excitement. And even though you couldn't see it right away, it's all right here. Five games in one. 22 million in prizes between 25 and 500 bucks. And a shot at a million dollar grand prize. Golden Casino. A night's worth of excitement for just 10 bucks. We continue talking Browns with Fred Greetham, senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. So, Fred, since we've talked last, uh, the Browns added Andy Dickerson, off, uh, offensive line coach for Bill Callahan, um, and we heard from Ken Dorsey. Uh, Dickerson is kind of interesting. I, I, I knew it, but it, it was reinforced. He was on Sean McVay's staff. With what they have added, do you expect um, this offense to be different in what it looks like relative to motion, shotgun, RPOs, those kind of things? I would think so. I, I think they elected to not stay with the status quo. Um, and I give a little credit in looking at this, Kevin Stefanski, just like last year, you know, overhauled the defense with Jim Schwartz and the special teams with Bubba Ventrone. Kevin Stefanski is kind of your de facto offensive coordinator, so they're not going to play a new offense, but they're going to retool it. And I think last year they spent the whole offseason trying to get it to fit around Deshaun Watson, and it looked like there was going to be some changes when we saw it in training camp, but I really never saw it materialize um, to be as explosive as I was kind of expecting. And... And then under Joe Flacco, he comes in, and that offense was about as explosive as I have seen in the four years under Kevin Stefanski. So I think you had to get maybe some fresh ideas, fresh look. And it makes sense to me that Ken Dorsey, who worked with Cam Newton and helped him be MVP when they went to the Super Bowl, and then he worked with Josh Allen, that wasn't his skill set as a quarterback, obviously, when he played for the Browns and other teams. But he's worked with quarterbacks that have been mobile and been successful. 
and it makes sense. I asked the question to Dorsey in the press conference, do you feel like your outside can come in with new ideas that maybe the, they haven't used here and implement them? And he said, basically, that's the goal and that's the task. And I think it's a smart move, whether it pans out or not, because I don't think anything Alex Van Pelt and those guys did wrong, but two years with Watson, we didn't really see a big change. And I think when you saw what happened with Flacco, why can't you implement kind of a pocket passer with Watson, but also a guy that has mobility? And and so I just think that's why they made the move. And, you know, obviously Callahan left, you know, with his son getting the head coaching job. And you knew that was going to happen someday. At least he was going to move on. And uh, Dickerson, again, fresh ideas. I think he got fresh ideas on the offensive line at running back, uh, tight ends, young offensive coordinator from Alabama, and then with Ken Dorsey. So you put that all together, I think you're going to have a retool of what Kevin Stefanski ultimately wants to run. But to make... You know, let's face it, Dave, everything's about getting Deshaun Watson, you know, back to an above average, not just above average, but to the elite level. You see these quarterbacks that are, you know, in the final four even, they were all the top quarterbacks, at least the starting quarterbacks. It's hard to gauge Watson because last year he started, he stopped, he started, he stopped. He's only played 11, 12 games in two years. So they know entering his third year, he's got to hit the ground running. They got to get him in a system where he can really, you know, take off and and have a great season. I, I know you wrote a, a, a series of articles um, on the offense in particular. Let's start um, tackle breakdown. So he, you got Wills coming back, you got Conklin, and you got Dewan Jones, who was really good. What do you think happens in that tackle position I think it's a big decision you got Jack Conklin who you extended and he has quite a bit of guaranteed money um to me it doesn't make sense if if Dewan Jones stepped in and played at an all rookie level he received awards as I mean the on the all rookie team why would you go back to you know, a guy that's come off of two season-ending injuries in the last three years. So they have to decide on that. And they have to decide, they've already decided to pick up the fifth-year option on Jedrick Wills, so they're locked into a $15 million contract. Do you let him play out the fifth year, or do you extend him long-term? And so, you know, it, there's a half a dozen things. Because you lost the top three, I think you'd be – um remiss to just move on from a Conklin, you know, for nothing. But then again, I can't see you going to Dewan Jones and putting him back on the bench if you're planning on Conklin at right tackle and Wills at left tackle. Then there's the whole dynamic. If you're wanting to move on from Wills, do you think Dewan Jones could play left tackle and trade Wills or, you know, or trade one of the three? and go with Conklin, right? I, I really don't know what they're going to do. You're, it's going to unfold soon when free agency comes. If they stand pat, then you know they're going to probably just go into the camp with the same guys. But you could have a restructure, you know, with Conklin, or you could trade him away. I really don't know. But it, it's some big decisions. And James Hudson, who you drafted, this will be going into the last year of his contract. I would think that he's been a little underwhelming in what they thought. They drafted him in the fourth round. They developed him. But when Conklin went down the first game, they immediately went to the rookie, DeWan Jones, as the starter at right tackle. And in the past, that would have been Hudson. So that tells you that they are higher on Jones than Hudson. Hudson had to finish the year because of the injuries to Conklin and Jones. So did he play well enough to reevaluate? Or what? So those four guys are all under contract, but how it shakes out could determine long term, you know, if, if you're going to bring in another guy. Because think about it, Garen Christian, you brought him in off the street, 
and he played the last seven, eight games for Wills at left tackle. I never really heard his name much. So I don't think he was terrible. So was he just, can, can you get somebody, you know, to, or do you have to pay Jedrick Wells 20 million a year, you know, to keep him around? I, I don't know what you do there, but they already made the decision to keep him for next year. So if they were to trade him, somebody would have to absorb, kind of like the Baker Mayfield trade, you'd have to get him to absorb that salary or eat some of it yourself. So we already talked um, about the wide receiving core, um, you know, last segment. You, you mentioned they, you feel you need they, to bring somebody in um, above uh, Elijah Moore or even above Amari Cooper. Somebody is that number two. Let's move on to running back. There's another one, and, and Andrew Barry even admitted it's the white elephant. You know, the elephant in the room is the Nick Chubb contract. What do you think they do um, at running back? Well, it is. I mean, that's why I think I titled it All Eyes on Nick Chubb. I mean, everybody loves him. He's a great player. The thing is, I, I'm pretty sure he's going to be able to return next year at some point. But he finished this year with a 6.1 yard per carry average in a limited time. But are you going to get a, his careers over five yards a carry? Are you going to get the five yard a carry back or a 2.8 or 3.2 or even four point yard carry um you know so it's a big decision and i think a lot of it's going to be the medical evaluations and how quickly he comes along they're going to do what's right for him he's got a 15 million dollar salary cap hit next year but it's none of it's guaranteed so they could walk away from it they're not going to do that but I think you'll see him do something like they did with Jack Conklin, restructure it, give him guaranteed up front, maybe extend it a couple years. Um, they were going to have to do something anyway, because even if he would have played this year, he had the same contract situation. So I think a lot of it's going to be the medical position. I don't know if they feel Jerome Ford long-term, they can hand it over to him. He showed explosiveness at times. But then there was times he was just kind of average. So right now, you got Jerome Ford and Pierre Strong under contract and Chubb. So I don't think they're going to go out and, you know, and make a big signing in free agency. That would be signing or that would be, you know, sending a message to Chubb, hey, we're moving on from you. Um, I think they would, if they draft one, I wouldn't be surprised if they do another fourth, fifth, sixth round pick like they did. I think Ford was a fifth round pick. They drafted Demetri Felton in the sixth or seventh round, Barry's first year. So I see them adding a running back. I just don't think it'll be in free agency. Fred Greetham, as always, uh, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Fred. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Fred Greetham, make sure you check him out. Senior analyst for the Orange and Brown Report. Always uh, really good and insightful Browns coverage. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We will see you back here Monday at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great weekend. We will see you Monday at 4 on Sports for CLE.